For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Benson. I'm a partner in the Asset Finance <coughs> Group at uh, Watson Farley. I'd just like to thank Nicholas and our hosts at Capital Inc. Uh, this is always a great event, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, um, particularly on this panel. Uh, if, if you've looked at the agenda, it's called Navigating the Green Drive. Um, when I think back only a few years, panels sort of like this at conferences were called, you know, things like getting to zero. And, you know, I think we've moved on from that and it suggests to me that the conversation has become, if not more micro, a little less theoretical and more practical. That said, you know, this is an issue that, as the panels before have suggested, it requires all of the stakeholders in the industry to be bought in. So it's important to have different perspectives on how we're getting there. We have a panel here today that's gonna to give us those perspectives. Um, but to that end, maybe we could get some context. If each of you wouldn't mind, maybe just going down the line, very briefly introducing yourself and sort of letting us know how navigating the green drive relates to your day today. Maybe start with you, Nico. Uh, thank, thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you, Nicholas, for, for having us again. Um, my name is Nico Schuss. I run a private shipping company in Germany, um, consisting on how you count somewhere in the, in the region of 50 to 60 vessels of different types. But today I'm here in the function as uh, president of BIMCO, uh, which I trust most of you uh, will know. And uh, BIMCO, of course, is extremely involved in the big issues of, 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 of shipping, and uh, one of that is decarbonization. Um, and, and I'm sure we will talk in uh, detail about the different aspects. As a general first comment, I'm optimistic <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, technologically open-minded. I'm a bit surprised that we talk about fuel and efficiency and not so much about carbon capture, but let me come back to that later, John. We Thank will. You. We will. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Knut Orbeck Nielsen. I'm the CEO of DNV Maritime um, Classification Society, but we're also producing quite a number of reports that the industry and its stakeholders appreciate, like the energy transition outlook, but also the maritime forecast. And uh, these are some of the, say, we, we like to base uh, the insights on facts and science and uh, not trying to be prejudiced in any respect. So thank you, good morning. Okay, uh, again, thank you very much for having me. My name is uh, Frederik Pinn. I am the managing director of Njord. Njord is a daughter company of Merce Tankers, which was initiated between Kargil, Mitsui and Merce Tankers uh, to give an external push on decarbonization, specifically around technology. Uh, with the notion that there is a lot of things that can be done, uh, but uh, it's not really being done to the extent that it could be. Uh, so definitely, from my side, very passionate around what are the things that can be done to accelerate uh, decarbonization. And I'm looking forward to, to talk about that uh, during the session today. Thanks. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Lucas Barbaris. I'm president of Safe Balkers. Uh, at Safe Barkers, uh, we consider the environment as our uh, highest priority. Uh, so we have uh, our policy is split into two folds. The one is uh, what we do with the existing fleet. And with the existing fleet, basically, we upgrade the, the performance of the vessels uh, through several technologies. And uh, the second point is what you do with the new builds. With new builds, we have ordered uh, several uh, new builds, about 16, replacing older, uh, gradually replacing older vessels. Uh, and also, we have entered into a zero uh, decarbonization phase by ordering uh, two dual methanol uh, fuel vessels, uh, which uh, will come in 2026 and 2027. So we have a comprehensive uh, policy uh, in, in all aspects. Thank you. Right, maybe if we could just start the conversation with just a very big picture. You know, it, it's, we've heard it at every one of these conferences, shipping accounts for, you know, 90% of global trade by volume and roughly 3% of GHG emissions. It, it, from that context, it would seem, you know, the industry is already extremely efficient based on its impact uh, to global trade versus GH, uh, GHGs. Why is it not, nonetheless critical that the conversation is had and that shipping as an industry as a whole 
as wide as that definition is, take the, the lead that it has decided to take in, in, this, in this initiative. Um, maybe start from my left and down. Okay, very, very, very good. If you prefer that we swap and you start with questions, because the first one always has the easiest pitch, so to say. Um, but let me start on this one. 2.8% uh, is, to my knowledge, the correct number, and that is important because we are already on a pathway of improvement, uh, not only in absolute terms, of course, with fleet growth, this will get more limited, but also compared to, to other industries. Um, we are an extremely efficient industry. And I usually use an example which, which I share here as well, which is not 100% scientific, but it shows how efficient ships, shipping is. We have about 70,000 ships in the water. Also there, there are different numbers. Some say 62, some mm -hmm. say 70, but it doesn't matter, roughly, that amount of ships uh, in the water. And on average, they use per ton mileage, or they emit per ton mileage, 40 grams of uh, CO2 equivalent emission. If you go jogging uh, in the Central Park and you do one mile without carrying a ton, just you do that on your own, you emit by breathing about 80 grams of CO2. So I, I, I know that that comparison is not correct because one is biogenetic and the other is not, but it shows how extremely uh, efficient shipping is. Why do I believe that we have to uh, decarbonize and that we will achieve decarbonization? Um, well, the shortest answer is because we can. Uh, we are globally regulated, which means the rules that are made for us count for everybody. There's no distortion of competition. We are cost insensitive. We heard this before the carbon, eh, not the carbon, the, the corona pandemic period showed us that we are cost uh, insensitive as an industry overall. We are competitive among each other like uh, we should be in an efficient industry. But as such, there's no cargo less transported because transport costs are going up. Uh, that is because transport costs overall are not very significant in the total cost calculation for most products that we uh, consume. And uh, that makes the consumer pay uh, the check. So once we have a clear pathway from the IMO of how to do it, we will do it. It's, as Bud just said, it's uh, a question of availability of the fuel, or I refer to that again, the uh, availability of carbon capture capacity, which I see as, as one major thing. But that's why I'm optimistic. Thank you. Please. And I just want to say thank you. So next time I talk myself out of going for a run, I won't feel bad about it. It's because of my, green, my commitment to a greener future. Very good. So thank that's, you. That's yeah. a good way to look at it. Key takeaway from today. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, I mean, if you really look at this from an elevated position, I mean, all of this is very much politically driven, right? So um, why would you want to try and, and optimize and spend a lot of efforts and money on decarbonizing one of the hardest uh, to abate sectors in the world, which is shipping, which is already, as we heard, uh, extremely efficient and environmental friendly. So, uh, but again, this is politically driven and it's sort of um, agreed that everyone should contribute regardless of how difficult or costly that might be. And, and, and that's the position in which shipping find itself. And um, as Nico said, um, of course, shipping can also contribute and uh, we should naturally do our part. And uh, even though it is really difficult, and we just heard the previous panel talk about the lack of uh, supply of better fuels. So, um, you know, this is a commitment that we have to the next generations, and we have to do the best that we can. And uh, there are some solutions, although they are not easy, and they don't come uh, at a low cost. Yeah, and I think in, in combination to that, uh, if shipping goes out of the equation, then it's like one of the bigger nations actually just opting out, which, which is not an option, right? I agree that when it goes across nations, it becomes more complex. Uh, and uh, as the previous panelist mentioned, if you don't like the complexity, you're in the wrong industry. I mean, it's just, just the setting. That's where we are, right? But so there's no, 
there's no just opting out because we actually represent those 2.8 equivalent to one of the bigger nations out there, right? So that's one thing. The second thing from my perspective is that it actually currently starting this decarbonization for the industry or continuing with the, with the means available at the moment uh, is actually commercially good sense. It actually makes sense from a lot of perspectives. And I think we just heard that, yes, we are globally regulated as well. We will see with the coming regulations that I actually think it will continue to make commercial sense to do so with the upcoming regulations. It does so today, just taking the first couple of steps, but it will also continue to do so in the, in the future with the new regulations that we see. So one thing is our obligation. The other thing is the commercial sense from my perspective. Uh, in terms of uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, of this uh, uh, less, uh, more efficient uh, shipping compared to other activities, I think that uh, uh, you cannot start excluding various sectors uh, in uh, when you create a policy. So when you say I will reduce, let's say, the carbon uh, footprint of the whole world by so much, you need to to, <coughs> to expand it to all sectors. Otherwise, then you will be left only with a power power, uh, power uh, uh, plants that burn uh, fossil fuels like uh, or uh, carbon and you say okay I'm happy that I did that but I mean uh, as we move along uh, all uh, parts of the industry need to have their own uh, uh, portion uh, in order to reach the decarbonization uh, uh, phase uh, by 2050. No, no I, I, I think you know, one big takeaway from these remarks is yes you know, at the end of the day, this is a business, though, and, and what are, what's going to drive this change, what has been driving the change. We've seen that regulations are key right now uh, in terms of influencing people's uh, decisions. How, how important do you feel current strategies, so the IMO strategy, um, and in particular, the indic indicative checkpoints that it places in front of the industry are right now towards driving process? Are, are they the key driver? Um, are they mission critical? Maybe start at the end and work our way back. So, yes. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the I mean, we uh, we as a company have understood well the the overall procedure, and uh, we have our uh, several people uh, addressing uh, all these uh, needs. Uh, the issue is that uh, uh, we don't know exactly. Uh, fuel availability, I and mean, there are various concerns in several sectors on, on how things would be uh, developed, uh, also costs. Uh, so one of the things uh, which uh, is important is uh, to create uh, uh, more clarity in this uh, process uh, of uh, dec decarbonization. So I think that uh, we need to continue on this way, and uh, we're committed on that. Yes, yeah, so I think when it, when it comes to the IMO regulations and the targets set, I think, it, first of all, it was very uh, positive to see consensus around setting a, a zero target for 2050 or on and about uh, 2050. And I think it, again, as a global regulation, it, it, uh, it creates some consensus around what we need to achieve uh, as an industry together. And the question is whether they have the means or IMO or the regulations currently have the means for us to get there, where I think that's probably where we would challenge it a bit. It has been discussed many times and whether the regulation as is right now has enough teeth in actually to push us towards those targets. But I think at least uh, that what we're seeing at the moment is that the, the EU is driving that uh, push uh, through the regulations that they're establishing at the moment and has much more uh, consequences built into it or these market-based measures, which I think is uh, when you start pulling those numbers, looking at how your fleet is performing, then it's clear that you have uh, incentive of, uh, of following those new regulations and moving towards those targets set. That's just a question on, on whether IMO will, will adopt some of the similar uh, uh, market-based measures in, in their regulations going forward. Yeah, a lot has been said already. Um, uh, regulators uh, are very key in this, naturally, and, and we are very fortunate in shipping to have uh, a global regulator. And, um, and naturally, a lot of the targets that came at MEPC 80 last July was, um, I would say, that they are more aspirations uh, than targets. Uh, but still, it's really important that we are pushing these uh, aspirations forward. Um, 2030, I think we probably will make it with, without the fuels. Um, 2040, 70% reduction, I think that's going to be extremely tough without the fuels. 
um, and net zero by 2050 naturally follows. But a lot can happen in, in, in the time span between now and then. And I think this industry has a lot of um, history and references of being creative, innovative, and smart. And, uh, and with the help of stakeholders in the wider ecosystem around shipping, uh, I think we should stay optimistic. But it's going to be a tough, tough fight, uh, and it's not going to be a, a walk in the park. But we need to get off on a good start, and that's where we recommend that, and, and it was also mentioned previously, uh, energy efficiency is really key, and we will need a price on carbon uh, also globally. Now the EU, as you said, uh, introduced that, but that is, is essential. Thank you. Yes, um, yes, as you said, most said. But let me comment a little bit, uh, uh, Frederick, on, 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 on what you said. Well, you didn't defend EU, but you mentioned it. Uh, we are, uh, in a way, opposing EU because we are opposing regional regulations. And I think we, as shipping, kid ourselves a bit if we believe that EU will take away their ETS system once there is a global system, because once the government has understood that the money is not going back into shipping, there may be a portion going back into shipping, but once the governments have understood that money is staying with them, it will be very, very tough to get a, the ETS system totally abolished compared to a, a global system. We need the global system. Um, I think it's not a question of whether there will be a pathway. There, it's just a, a question of how this will be defined. There is MEPC meeting 81 coming up next week, um, defining the technical steps which are then supposed to be adopted. I think MEPC 85 or 83 or whatever by, by, by end of 25. So the wagon is rolling. We, we, we as shipping will have to face the situation that there will be regulation that will force us to do this or that step. But as I said before, I'm optimistic because it doesn't harm. Uh, we get the check for it and we pass it on to the shipper, a bit briefly spoken, but basically that is the cost <coughs> and sensitivity that, that, that we have in this industry. So yes, that's, that's how I, I, I look at it. One of the words used multiple times there was efficiency, 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 suggesting there might be a business case found in efficiency. You know, we, we've, we've heard it in many, many panels, even here today, that unless it makes some sense for the bottom line, you know, most owners aren't going to take the initiative now. Um, you know, it's, a, it's the early adopter sort of theory. Um, what is the current business case and, and, and in, that you think is a real, should be a driver right now for this? Maybe, Frederick, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. I, so this is basically our, our bread and butter. It's actually to highlight what are the business cases for the owners based on what have we learned on the Maersk fleet. Uh, so what do we believe is, is good uh, business? Uh, when it comes to energy efficiency uh, uh, technologies. And there is a good business to be made. It, it actually adds up. Um, so there are more than 40 different technology enhancements you can do on vessels today. And that's not necessarily including some of the more novel technologies such as wind assist, propulsion, air lubrication, or carbon capture, which I'm also quite keen on, on discussing. But, uh, but this is just simple measures that you can do. And if you look at it as a holistic business case of deploying a multitude of those, Combine it as a package, uh, look at the combined return on investment, the combined savings. Uh, then what we have seen so far is on an average, uh, uh, the vessels we've worked on in, in Yacht, more than 200 now, you can save around 12% plus minus with a payback time of a year and a half. If you then start adding in the upcoming EU regulations, like them or not, then uh, that actually can shave off up to uh, six months from that return on investment. So it's a good business case, 12% uh, uh, and year, year and a half uh, payback time. Every vessel is different, every trading route is different. You can't, there's no one size fits all, but there's a lot of different options out there. We heard from the previous uh, uh, panel with some of the ship owners here in the tanker industry that they have done a lot. I would consider some of those as, as front runners. Uh, what we see in the industry that there's a lot of uh, hopefully fast uh, followers and conservatives who have yet not started this journey. Um, so it's about uh, highlighting those opportunities and then starting that journey for those ship owners because they represent a large part of the world fleet today. Anyone else care to comment? The business case today, is how do you see it? Yeah, uh, 
uh, I would say energy efficiency is very important, but um, it does not lead to decarbonization. It's completely different because, uh, as we may see, since, uh, let's say, 2008, we have more efficient vessels by 10, 20, 15 percent, 30 percent. But um, uh, also the trade increases. So at the end of the day, we will not have a, a decarbonization if we continue in this path. Uh, the path, uh, the clear path, should be the selection of uh, alternative fuels, which is very important. Uh, the selection and also a means of, of using uh, carbon capture. And I'm saying means, uh, it's, uh, it's not only on board the vessel, which, I mean, there is a technology and uh, this can be optimized, but uh, basically what you do with the carbon, uh, how, to, how do you dispose the carbon capture? So I would like to point out two questions, uh, two, uh, two, two issues. The one is uh, how you dispose, you, you need to come to, with us and how do you dispose the CO2? So people will then go gradually towards this direction because you have a huge fleet and the CPS will not be able to produce a new ships or whatever we decide. And the second point is the production of alternative fuels, which will give, let's say, the, a path towards decarbonization. And I would like to highlight, just because everybody said that, I would like to highlight the importance of global standards for fuels because, uh, uh, okay, we have right now EU ETS, and then we have fuel EU, and maybe we have an American system and a British system, a Chinese system, and uh, you, you need to have a huge <laughs> bureaucracy <laughs> to, to, to run all a, a company, depending on where the, where, where the vessel is, if you have, let's say, for example, 50 vessels. So we need to have a global system which will be applicable and will lead uh, effectively towards decarbonization. Thank you. Maybe just a yeah. follow -up, quick follow-up on that and also to, to your point from before, Knud. I mean, at, for me, the energy efficiency goes hand-in-hand -hand with the new fuels. And we, we've discussed already here today, they're not ready. We don't know exactly what will be the new fuels of tomorrow, probably a combination. But it goes hand-in-hand -in, -hand in terms of those new fuels will be more expensive. The density will mean that you will need higher volumes to travel the same distance, i.e. you need to make the vessels both as efficient you can today, but also the future vessels. And it's the most tangible thing you can do to reduce at least your current emissions. But I, I get your point. But for me, it's, it goes hand in hand. It will have to be I, I, both. I, I definitely agree because uh, we, we, we have uh, done uh, environmental projects in all our ships, but the question is we, we don't go to, uh, towards energy. Mm -hmm towards decarbonization, we just reduce the energy that we need. But at the end of the day, we have more, more, and more ships out there that will burn more fuel. Mm -hmm. well, I'd be remiss, given the experience on the panel here, if we didn't drill down on that, setting aside the alternative fuel, which is out there, and that's, that's absolutely essential, as we've said, to meeting some of the longer-term goals. W what can and should be done today, generally speaking, that can sort of you know, get those efficiencies, but also at the same time, we think talking about numbers like 12%, if implemented properly, make a real business case. You know, and, and where you know, is it? Is it all about technology, and where are we on that tech cycle, or is it about just simpler things, like, you know, slow steaming? What, what is it? What what can be implemented today, and what should be emphasized today? And is, is technology the driver of all of that at the moment? Um. John, maybe before we, I, I, I come to that, let me quickly come back to the business case, because I find <laughs> that uh, from, a, from a ship owner's point of view very important. We are not only um, deciding on the main engine that we order on the basis of which fuel we intend to use, uh, but we do that with uh, thoughts about resale values of ships with regards to charters preferences on the ships with regards to the ability to improve the engine capacity with a technological um, development. So there are many, many aspects on uh, the decision taking which main engine you use. Uh, we, for example, ordered uh, car carriers with uh, LNG uh, main engines, which was very, very much in fashion two years ago. Um, um, it's still the right path to go. It's one path, and I know Knud is a believer in, in LNG. But whether that is, is still the case in three, four years, when you have ammoniac main engines, that's, that's doubtful. So it's a business decision which is not a single calculation. It's a multifaceted faceted decision, and it's not clear. One business model which I feel is underestimated, and maybe we should but ask Bat Da to explain how that works. But 
What I find interesting is this methanol uh, trade from China to Europe on mask ships. And what they actually transport is not those containers on those ships as green transported containers, but what they produce is green ton mileages that they then can sell for somebody who wants to transport a container from Copenhagen to Hamburg at an enormous price. Um, and that, that makes a good business case out of that. And um, I will afterwards but come up to you and have this discussed in more detail <laughs> because I'm very interested to understand the mathematics of, 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 of that. Thank you. Maybe I can just um, comment a please, little bit. Yeah. So um, with respect to the business case, I think th there are, say, lots of things that can be done on the technical side, and, and we've touched upon that. There are also many things that can be improved on the operational side. Um, and um, also, I would say there should be possibilities to improve also on the commercial contracts so that you are not sort of bound to be in a certain place at a certain time and then sit there, wait for, for a long time uh, and burning more fuel than necessary. Um, and then um, it was also mentioned on one of the previous panels around digitalization and how that might help us to optimize and monitor and, and improve the whole process. So, so there are quite a bit of opportunities. And in my view, I mean, it's a no-brainer to, to try and explore all of these avenues because, as mentioned, I mean, the, the fuels that we will be using in the future will be more expensive. So the less you consume, the more efficient you are. It, uh, I mean, money talks, and that's, uh, that's it. Um, just a, a comment, uh, since we are talking about some of the different fuel types. So. Um, if I just share with you the uh, statistics from last year on the different uh, dual fuel contracts that were placed in 2023. Um, so we saw uh, quite an equal portion of uh, dual fuel LNG and dual fuel uh, methanol vessels being ordered. So nearly 140 each were placed last year. And um, if you think about the previous year, so 2022, uh, we only saw about 35 dual fuel methanol. So it was quite an increase in the number of dual fuel methanol. If you now look to, to this year, only two months into the year, um, in January, it was a little bit more on the dual fuel methanol, and in February, a little bit more on the dual fuel LNG. So that's where we are at the moment, and I agree with, uh, with Nico that uh, we will also be exploring dual fuel ammonia and probably also uh, single fuel ammonia vessels a little further down the line, in my view. Um, so there are quite a lot of opportunities, and then many talk about uh, small modular reactors, and, uh, and that's also a very interesting avenue to be explored, although it will be even a little bit further down the line, and uh, maybe not installed on the vessels, but rather used onshore to produce fuels. We will see. Maybe some of us will be retired by then, but anyway, the industry will find out. Lucas, I won't ask how many uh, modular reactors you've considered over the last few few months, but w your views on the, the dual, dual fuel decision today, on, on, on when, when looking at it. You know. uh, look, the, uh, the fuels that we, I mean, uh, that we all know are uh, certain. Uh, I mean, uh, quite specific. We have the fossil fuels, which is uh, what we we need to get rid of, uh, and we try it with energy efficiency measures to the existing fleet to reduce. Uh, and then we have, let's say, three other fuels. The one is the ammonia, the, LNG, uh, the, the ammonia, the LNG, hydrogen, and uh, uh, methanol. LNG uh, is a is an, a very uh, dual fuel LNG vessel. It's very expensive because it has a huge infrastructure in order to to be built. And second, it's not it's still fossil. So at certain point of time. Uh, but, but it's there. I mean, you can go and buy LNG today. Uh, well, you cannot buy methanol. Uh, ammonia, I am a little bit reluctant because still you don't have any, uh, any actual uh, engines operating with ammonia, and uh, it represents also a huge risk to the people where you, if there's any accident, uh, you will have uh, several uh, uh, people died. Methanol is a safe uh, 
Uh, let's go first of all to, to hydrogen. Hydrogen uh, is uh, a weak uh, fuel for the uh, for vessels. I mean, if you produce hydrogen, it's better to put it in a in a let's say in a city system, so you will uh, by two percent increase the, uh, the, the the quality of the fuel. Uh, on the other hand, the methanol uh, looks uh, promising, but uh, I would like to agree that uh, at the end of the day, maybe the solution lies to certain other things which are called modular uh, reactors, which will come maybe after in 2040 or uh, 2045, uh, and uh, that could be an actual solution. Nico, your take on that particular? No, no we, we can have the others first. I ju just want to make the case afterwards for the ammonia, because I'm a strong believer of ammonia, and I always <laughs> like to share views with somebody who is not a believer of ammonia. Afterwards, maybe you are. Yes, <laughs> Frederick, go ahead. I think then it's here. <laughs> uh, okay, well, the, the um, methanol technology is proven. It's, it's, it's simple. The infrastructure is, is, is there. It's pretty safe. Uh, the energy density is comparatively good. Um, so, so everything speaks for, for, for methanol. The only way to produce methanol in a green way is if you have it hydrogen-based and you combine with C. And only if this C is biogenetic, um, it makes sense to burn methanol, because otherwise you may as well use fossil fuels. Biogenetic C in the amounts needed for shipping. It's complete dreaming to believe that this can be a significant portion of it. We need, and this number is coming from uh, Knut's organization, uh, to, to, we need the energy to, to steam our 60, 70,000 ships of about 700 nuclear power, power plants of 100 gigawatt each, which uh, exists today 356 or something. So we have to double our nuclear energy capacity to uh, uh, steam our ships. If you would do that with a biogenetic sea, you would not grow a little soya field somewhere in uh, Denmark or wherever where Maersk is having it, and that's why they are using it, and that works. You would basically have to use every agricultural uh, capacity on the planet to do that. So I simply don't believe that there is a case for scaled methanol. Now, if you use ammonia, you combine it with nitrogen, which is uh, Seventy percent of everything around us here in the in in, in the atmosphere, um, and if you burn it again, you have uh, water and and uh, nitrogen. Of course, there are disadvantages. I know them uh, in ammonia. Uh, it's poisonous. It's smelly. It's uh, it's emitting laughing gas. Sounds funny, but it's not funny. It's a very very serious uh, greenhouse uh, gas, um, but. I think that is technological problems, regulatory problems on how we make the engine room safe, etc. But that is possible to be achieved. It's not possible to produce enough biogenetic C to feed the fleet. So it's, it's, I think it's interesting to I, change. Uh, yeah, this. look, I, I'm not against ammonia. This is a solution. Uh, the issue is that if we can, uh, for example, the industry can develop. Uh, or can uh, focus on a specific fuel, this will help us all because, for example, a ship with ammonia, if you want to order it today, there is, there is no such ship, there is no such engine, and uh, ammonia could be a solution, but you need also a, a huge, uh, um, a several problems to be, to be resolved. And methanol, I think there are several mechanisms that you can produce, and, but I, I still believe that uh, ammonia could, be, could play a role in the future. I mean, after uh, uh, five, ten years, there might be a, a more uh, advanced role, especially in uh, larger, in larger uh, ships. Uh, and, uh, but what we really want is if the, if the policy makers could end up with something more specific, because if we want to focus on a specific uh, ship, uh, then uh, we can design it, we can uh, take the protective measures, we can take the risk. Right now we cannot take the risk. Ammonia is more expensive. It's always interesting to follow that conversation. 
Yeah, I think we have to probably realize that for shipping over the next several decades, there will be a multitude of different fuels. So, um, I mean, th th there's really no point in arguing this is better or this is uh, is worse. I mean, we, we need all the better fuels we can get our hands on, basically. Mm. And, um, uh, and uh, I think it, it's probably a wet dream to think that we will be you know, running over uh, vessels on one fuel uh, for the next several decades. So we have to sort of adapt to that future. It is interesting. Uh, yeah. the, the, the lack of consensus across the market is something interesting to follow. And as it, it, that changes, I think it'll be very telling. Um, personally, I haven't had to order a vessel myself. My clients made that decision before they come to me, but I've just been tasked with chairing a committee to replace the boiler in my apartment building. I will say the order book for boilers in New York City is 100% dual fuel right now. <laughs> um, mindful of the time, uh, maybe if we could all just sort of closing remarks, it just out of general. What are we doing well in the industry and what do we need to do better to meet these goals, right? Just big picture. Maybe we'll work our way down one last time. Yeah, that's, you. that's me again, okay. Yeah. Sorry for that, I, I will be very brief. Um, at a, at a, another conference a couple of weeks ago, a journalist came up to me because on the panel I had mentioned what is important, I had mentioned collaboration uh, among the voices of the industry is important and he said, well, this story is uh, old, it's this, this, this was first talked about by Helmut Sohmann uh, some of you may may remember him uh, 30 years ago that the round table uh, should work closer together. Uh, I think it may be an old case, but it's an extremely important case. We have uh, the regulator, very, very open-minded Secretary General with Arsenio Dominguez, um, who wants to listen to the industry more than maybe his predecessors were open to, to listen to. And I think the industry would make a huge mistake not trying to agree internally on the messages that we want to have. Or if we cannot agree, and for sure, uh, I had this morning a quick discussion, uh, we will not agree on every single point. But then at least we can agree on this is your time to sing and we are standing in the back and, and, and listen carefully because the worst we could do is confuse an open-minded, uh, interested, really trying to do good Secretary General at IMO. We have to speak as one voice. That would be my biggest pitch for the industry at the moment. Yeah, um, I will continue a bit on, on that. Um, Bad mentioned this morning about collaboration, how important that is. Um, and uh, I would say that we, uh, we as an industry have come a long way in not only collaborating between ourselves, but also collaborating more with the stakeholders consisting or making up the ecosystem in which we operate. So that's all the way from financiers to charters to fuel producers, regulators, etc. So that, that is a great step forward and it's really needed. Um, uh, what can we do better? Uh, I think we, we haven't really discussed it this morning, but I think we as an industry have a tremendous challenge um, with attracting seafarers for the future. I think we should really appreciate the seafarers, the, the work they are doing. They are, they are the key to safe uh, decarbonization of our industry. And all the hardships that also was mentioned in one of the previous panels with rockets, etc. Coming out of COVID, um, I mean, we will need more and better trained seafarers uh, to, you know, make this journey a successful one. I think that's a, a big shout out to the industry. We need to take better care of our seafarers and attract more young talents to the seafaring occupation. Thank you. Yeah, so I think what, I've, what I like about this industry is actually that there's a lot of discussion and passion around how do we decarbonize. I think it's, it's taking up a lot of, uh, of, of discussion room uh, and that's super important. I think we see front runners out there testing, piloting, 
learning from that, and we've talked about collaboration, I also see that there's a lot of sense of collaboration in the industry. So I think that passion needs to continue because that's what's going to take us there. What, what, I've, what I've liked to see change is that we, we cannot be also paralyzed by that passion when we then come to the conclusion that it's going to be difficult or that we don't know what the answer is or it's going to be a multitude of the fuels and what's the right thing to bet on. So I think avoid being paralyzed and then as a flip side to that, start doing what is tangible, what's reasonable. We talked about it at this uh, panel as well. Energy efficiency is a, is a no-brain in terms of regardless of where we end up out here. So, so avoid being paralyzed, use that passion rightfully so, and then start uh, reducing uh, emissions here now and what is commercially sensible viable at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, for me I will go to more uh, focused uh, ideas. Uh, one, uh, global fuel standards uh, very quickly and unification of all controls uh, and enforcement uh, worldwide. This is very important for any kind of system to uh, to be successful. Second, uh, I mean, uh, focusing or prioritizing the fuels, the alternative fuels, so we can, uh, so, so the shipping companies uh, who are, let's say, basically drivers. I mean, we are drivers and we go to the industry to buy a ship. We don't uh, do, we don't develop a technology. So we, what we want is to have, let's say, a prioritization of uh, alternative fuels so we know where to invest. Because we, you need uh, main investment. And uh, third, a, a global solution uh, for uh, disposing of, of CO2 because nothing can be achieved if you don't dispose the CO2 or you don't uh, have carbon capture. Carbon capture will play a big role, but it's extremely expensive and you don't know how to dispose it. And maybe fourth, uh, uh, advanced, uh, advanced uh, research on uh, modular reactors. So this is uh, important. <laughs> solution at the end. Thank you. I see we're out of time. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you again to Capital Inc. for having us. Thank you.